Well, yeah. welcome everybody to Web3 Music Demystified, brought to you by VNDO and Muse3. Uh, I would like to start by acknowledging that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Victoria. Um, as Elizabeth said, this meeting is being recorded, but I hopefully won't bother anybody since we won't be seeing your faces or your voices, but there's uh, the chats there if you feel like asking any questions. Um, we've got some great minds here today, some great tech minds, some great music minds. What it turns out we don't have is anybody with any massive experience in Zoom webinars, so uh, bear with <laughs> us on uh, on that one. And um, I'm going to pass over to Elizabeth, who's going to introduce the rest of the panel to you. Yes. Thank you, Neil. And big thank you to VMDO for helping us make this panel happen today. Uh, so, hey, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Hare. Um, I'm the co-founder of Muse and your host and moderator today. So for those of you here who don't know what Muse is, I'll just give you a quick intro. So Muse is an Australian Web3 music education initiative. Um, we've hosted a number of music and Web3 meetups around Australia. We have a free music and Web3 fundamental introductory course that was funded by VMDO. Um, and we have a open community of professionals and enthusiasts at that anyone is welcome to join. Um, I'll post some details of it later on in the chat for anyone that might be interested to check it out. However, moving on to the reason why we're actually here tonight, um, we are going to delve into the world of Web3 and music with our fantastic panelists. So we have Katie Brown from Serenade and independent artists Stonewax and Lauka. Hey guys. How you doing? Hey. So these guys are going to be sharing their experiences with Web3 and touch on some challenges, misconceptions, and the future that it holds. Um, they'll also provide some insights for those looking to get started in the space. And we'll also have some time for Q&A at the end. Now on that, I'm not sure if you've seen, uh, but we did issue a poll at the start of the panel to gauge your Web3 knowledge. Not no, sure if that's up though, is it Neil? Yeah, here it comes. <laughs> cool. The main point is doesn't matter what your level of knowledge is here. Um, all questions are welcome. And seeing as we have a really nice, cozy turnout today, we encourage you all to engage in the chat. So before we begin, um, I will properly introduce our fine cast of panelists. So first up is Katie. Katie Brown is the artist and industry partnership lead at Serenade. So Serenade is a music company that uses Web3 tech to serve artists, fans, and rights holders. Last year, they launched the chart accredited digital pressing product with Muse, which a content rich and carbon light limited edition release format. Serenade's digital pressings are Web3 enabled quick and easy to produce with perpetual royalties and a tiny carbon footprint. Neil, we can see the I know, I know. <laughs> I know. Okay, cool. I will just continue. Um, now, Katie has 10 years experience creating and implementing creative artist partnerships in the music industry, including roles at major labels, Universal and Sony. She's passionate about harnessing new tech to nurture the artist-fan relationship. Next, I'm thrilled to introduce Lauka. So Lauka is a Borneo-born, Mijin-based producer, vocalist, multi-instrumentalist, and DJ. She creates effervescent, glitch future club music with high-octane aesthetics. Uh, Lauka presents her work through the lens of her experience as a queer woman of color, and not only is she a classically trained musician, she has performed at an impressive lineup of festivals such as St. Jerome's Laneway Festival, FOMO and Big Sound. She's also supported international artists such as Charlie XCS and Aria winner Genesis Owusu. She's also done numerous Web3 music releases. 
Now, last but not least is stone wax. Stone wax or Steve Summers is an experimental artist and producer based on the Sunshine Coast. He is the founder of Equalize, which provides guidance for musicians on their blockchain and Web3 music journeys. And as a musician and producer, Stonewax has worked with esteemed producers and composers such as Polly B and OJ Newcomb, and he's collaborated on numerous records and Web3 releases with a diverse range of artists. For Stonewax, creating music is a form of meditation and a way to escape the confines of reality and explore new sonic landscapes. So thank you guys. <laughs> thank you for being here today. How are we all doing? Yeah, good. Thanks for having us. Thanks. It's. I think I'll let someone else talk for a little while now. Um, so let's dive straight into the questions. I'll kick off straight away with a big one. So in your view, why should we pay attention to music and Web3? Uh, who'd like to go first? Maybe Katie? Yeah, I'll kick off. So I guess Web3 offers artists just a new way to release their music. Um, at Serenade, we give artists the opportunity to release their music as digital pressings, as you mentioned in that intro. They're kind of quite similar to a digital vinyl, they're chart accredited and they're structured to allow for more exclusive content to be added. So artists can reward their top fans and build stronger fan communities. Whereas I think some other platforms tend to lean into a bit more into the Web3 community at Serenade, we're quite complimentary in the fact that we encourage all music fans to participate in this new music format, regardless of their kind of understanding of Web3 or blockchains. Um, and really, we're just providing a new format for artists to release their music. I think one of the most important things of kind of Web3 music and utilizing blockchain technology is that it allows for that verifiable ownership. So it really gives fans a chance to collect songs online. They can keep them or sell them on a secondary market. And really fans can establish that direct relationship with their favorite artists. I think as well as releasing music on traditional, traditional ways, like on streaming platforms where everyone can listen Artists can now also use digital pressings or other music NFTs to assign ownership of like rare limited edition collectible versions of their songs, albums or EPs. So you don't have to buy a song to listen to it via like a streaming service. But with digital pressings, like an artist can say, you know, here's my song. I'm only ever releasing 25 digital editions or whatever number that may be. Um, you can listen to it for free, or if you'd like, collect a limited edition digital pressing of it. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, that's probably like why I think Web3 is important for artists. Yeah, that's that's really interesting and a good point. It's kind of like the, the new age version of collecting a signed vinyl or something, right? So as um, artists, Stomax and Lauka, do you have anything to sort of add to that? Uh, yeah, I guess I would say that um, as an artist, it, it's just really foolish to not, from a business perspective, not take a look at, at new technology and at least be educated in it. If, if you're not wanting to jump fully into it, at least be educated and, um, you know, over it because um, you don't want to be, as, you know, you don't want to find yourself outdated or left behind and then suddenly you know the whole world changes and you've got no way to I guess do your job as an artist or performer or I guess this this applies to anyone working in the music industry whether it's a &R or um you know whatever format it's it's just good to be across it um I always say knowledge is power so totally adding to both Lalka and Katie Three things, ownership is huge. You know, with the current states of our social media and Spotify, we don't own any of our stuff. As soon as we upload it, they own it. Ownership's huge. Thousand true fans, it's a better place than ever to get that thousand true fans. Um, do, you, do you want to briefly elaborate on the thousand true fans theory? Yeah, so community is 
pretty much the number one focus point in this space for any business or artist. And if you don't have a community, you've got nothing to sell people. Well, sorry, you can't sell anything to people because they won't buy it. They don't, they need to trust you. So community, like if you're thinking of your thousand true fans and that very well-known concept, this is the space where you can create that without having to rely on all these other aggregators. And the third point was passive income. There's huge opportunity for passive income here. And like Lalka said, businesses got to take advantage, otherwise get left behind. Yeah, for sure. So I want to talk perhaps a little bit more on those uh, themes, both from the industry and artist perspective, but your experiences. Um, so I guess firstly for Stonewax and Out Lauka, what actually made you decide to do your first Web3 music release and what has your been your experience with it so far? Um, Lauka, Lauka, if you wanted to kick yeah. up. I, it was honestly like what I said, like personally, I just felt like it was my responsibility to look into it as an artist and because I view my career as, you know, a career and business, like I was like, well, I, I got to be responsible for my own career. And so I started looking into it and then really <laughs> liked what I found out, what I learned. Um, and so I was curious to try it and decided to just do it. I, I'm the type of person who learns a lot by doing. And so instead of just like reading or hearing about it, I decided to just do it and experiment. And then I shared my learning journey about it, um, like just on my social media, my Web2 social media with my uh, community. And um, I think it's been really good in that sense where um, <clears throat> I've it, it made me think of other things that are not just Web3, like I guess, the, like, you know, like Steve was saying, the concepts of Thousand Through Fans, um, you know, you really, really do see that play out in, in Web3, but when you really think about it, even from a small business perspective, even if like owned a cafe, you know, you have your your regular customers that come and buy a coffee from you every day. They're, the, they're also the ones who will buy the extra muffin or, you know, come and support you, say, if your shop got flooded, you know. And um, I, I think I just in, in general, like learning how to run the, uh, the business of being an artist uh, mm -hmm. from uh, a deeper perspective rather than just, oh, you know, you got to like go on TikTok. I mean, sure, that's one aspect, but like, I think there's there's so much more that artists can try, and I was just really interested in trying different things. Right, and yeah. and it's um, yeah, really interested, interesting rather with the a thousand true fan theory, a thousand true fan theory, even a hundred true fans in Web three is you can sort of uh, you have the ability to have a sustainable career and income by just having a hundred or a thousand fans opposed to sort of trying to get those millions of streams of Spotify and having to do those things like plug yourself on TikTok and constantly make that content. Um, I do. I'm not saying that, oh, well, now I'm not on TikTok. Like I'm on TikTok every day, but. You need I'm to talk saying, it, don't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm saying like not, it's not, I think maybe there's, sometimes I feel like there's this like, perception of it's one or the other but mm -hmm. you can do both uh you can I guess pick and choose what aspects you like and yeah. what you want to practice totally agree and I think you can totally create sorry cater this to suit you and where you're at in your career or yeah. wherever you are you know um they're tools it's a set of tools that are allowing us to funnel business in a completely different and decentralized way it's it's they're not being managed by like we're, we're putting songs like um serenade are doing we, you're creating these special records for nerds like me who i'll go and spend 200 dollars on a pressed record because it's rare for nerds like me this is what I've been waiting for you know that doesn't yeah. happen in Spotify that doesn't happen on social media no. you know and I think also like we like I was at the very beginning of my journey I was thinking about how you know when Napster came onto the scene this is what over 10 years ago and you know the record like labels tried to fight it and then 
artists didn't really do anything about it, did they? I mean, everyone was just like, oh no, no piracy. But like, and then what happened is that now we have not music companies controlling the music business, but tech companies, Spotify, Apple, their tech companies like TikTok, their tech companies controlling what we as artists do. So I was like also thinking, are artists just going to sit back again this time and let that happen again? Or are artists going to educate themselves and, you know, find ways to, to not let the tech companies, you know, take on this next uh, revolution of, of how tech is going and, and shape the music industry. So I thought that was like a responsible thing to do as an artist is like, if, you know, if I, I care about my work. So I was like, well, I'm going to do my homework here then. And I try to, you know, not not just sit back and and let things run out of control. But, you know, try try my best at least. Yeah. And, so, and being an independent artist, like it's totally okay yeah. to explore, experiment, and fail. You know, I think even for a business that's pivoting, like Serenade, you know, like why not test the boundaries and push and push what's possible in this early time? So. Ditto, ditto, Laka. Yeah, I think you touched on a really good point as well, both of you, but also looking at how music fans engage with music on streaming platforms like Spotify and Apple, it's created a lot of those kind of more lean back listeners where mm. they'll just put on a playlist and not might recognize a song but have no idea what the artist actually looks like. It's not a platform that allows artists to really connect with art uh, with their fans. Yeah. And one of the going back to the idea around these 1,000 true fans or even 100 true fans is, I guess, with digital pressings or just generally um, products that utilize blockchain technology, actually, you're inviting your fans into this reciprocal relationship where, you know, essentially, when a fan becomes the owner of one of your digital pressings, they're buying that rare limited part of your catalog. And if they ever choose to sell that edition to turn a profit later down the line, they're supporting you with a considerable 15% royalty in perpetuity. But that is actually quite empowering on both ends that we just don't have with other forms of music release formats. It's win-win. Yeah, and going back to what you were saying so much about, you know, I'll, I'll drop $200 on a nice physical pressing that means something to me. Mm-hmm. We see those pop up on eBay all the time and the artist never gets a kickback from seeing their limited edition physical vinyl increase in value. Whereas with digital pressings or other forms of NFTs, we let the <coughs> artist, you know, get a cut of that as the value increases, which I think is really important for artists. And also being able to connect with their fans in a in a direct way. You know, on well, particularly on Serenade, you can see your first owners listed next to the release. So as a fan, it's, it's almost like I, I know that my favorite artist knows that I'm a top fan. And as an artist, you know who your top fans are. I think it's about bringing artists and fans back into a space where that relationship can be more engaging and more beneficial for both versus some of the other platforms where people consume music today. And because we spend, well, I don't want to put out a percentage because I don't actually know, but we spend so much time online, so much time in this digital space. Why not create assets for the digital environment? People are going to be buying virtual land for their for their bear, man, bear, pig, Lamborghini tractors to park <laughs> in their spaceships. They can buy a record digitally and collect that for their, you know, or a piece yeah. of art for their virtual wall. Like it's and they it's, can play it in their Lambo. Right. And it's right around the corner. This is so close. And, yeah. and I guess like on the other side of things, like, you know, for people who, who don't buy land <laughs> in, you know, in sandbox or whatever, they mm. I I guess another way to look at it as well is that I guess like in our lives, we have so much clutter. You know, like this, this, and and if you want to keep collecting stuff but you run out of space, like having things digitally is like just far more environmentally friendly, um, despite the the myth that was floating around twenty twenty one. So you know, you're 
you're being more conscious about the environment. You're, uh, I guess, making, just streamlining your life. I'm just thinking like, I, I can't imagine like having, you know, a, a, a home full of stuff that's overflowing, especially if you're a passionate collector um, as well. So, and I think like another way when I was first starting to share this journey, another way I was explaining to, to people, like because I think and music NFT specifically, was a bit hard for people to wrap their heads around because people are so used to getting music for free. Like they turn on the radio, they get Spotify, it's free. They're like, well, why would I want to pay X amount for that? And then I guess I want, besides explaining, you know, the the extras that come, uh, the unlockables, like, you know, the extra things that come, like sometimes I explain it in other forms. Like, you know, if, if you were a fashion lover, you would spend, you know, thousands of dollars on a shoe and, some people might not get that. Some people are like, why can't I just go to Kmart and get a pair of shoes? But to mm-hmm. say the fan of the designer, they want that drop, that limited edition summer 2023 drop. And I think once you explain it in, in different ways, so to the, to the fashion lover, maybe someone who collects cars, you know, someone who, who wants that 1963 Mustang, and it's, it's the same for music lovers. And I think sometimes just using, well, what's the word called when we use something to compare the analogies of like different products, mm-hmm. perhaps explains music NFTs in a more concrete way to, yeah. to like the public. Right. So I guess on that and sort of different, different strategies of releasing content in Web3, um, I want to look over to Katie. So at um, Serenade, you sort of worked with a lot of major artists such as Muse and Ladyhawk, um, along with many indie artists. So I wanted to sort of talk about the differences between strategies. Based on experience, have you noticed any variances um, in yeah strategies, motivations for entering the, st- uh, the space? Um, I guess from a Serenade perspective, we have worked with artists at all stages of their career. And the objectives do change with every individual artist. And those objectives can be from everything of the reasons of why they want to try a new release format versus to the objectives of what they want to get out of it. Some artists are happy for their release to be a slightly higher edition size and just sit on Serenade and be discoverable by people that are interested in this release format and other artists would prefer to sell out within the first 24 hours or at least the first week. With the Serenade Digital Pressing, it is chart accredited. So we do see with a lot of the major label artists or slightly more established artists that they do use it as a way to help chart position on release week. So that's obviously quite interesting space for them. Traditionally, like at the moment, we see a lot of artists creating cassettes, which just end up straight in landfill or CDs or directing to digital downloads. And by I think, you know, the digital pressing is a much more environmentally friendly way of pushing your chart position compared to some of the other release formats, which literally just end up in landfill. So it's nice to be able to offer something different for that level of artists. And then I think with more kind of emerging artists, we're seeing that they want to get involved early. And like, as Lauka was saying, you know, educating themselves as an artist around what is this and how do I participate? But not only that, how do I bring my fans with me from the start? So they're on the journey very early on. They get used to me building this community with them. And it's it's quite interesting to see some of the releases that we've worked on with emerging artists recently is that I'll start off very small, just doing like 25 and then increase it gradually to 30 or 40 with this understanding that actually fans know that I want to get in quick because I know that that's the only time they'll ever do one, I'll I'll ever get one of 25. So Mm. I think, yeah, it's, it's really um, open to all artists. And I think it's, it's, there's a lot of different objectives of why people want to do it. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I I think on that, I really want to talk about challenges, but I do um, just want to ask Stonewax. So you've you've also experimented with a lot of different Web3 music platforms, Sound XYZ and so forth. Um, Yeah, I was just curious as far as your your strategy, if you have any insights that you've gotten from that 
um, you know, as far as community engagement, building relationships with your fans, is there a method you prefer over the others? Look, um, we kind of still have the issue, like even in our current state of tech, we have this issue of shit is everywhere. You know what I mean? Like, where do you face, start? Where, whatever you're doing, <laughs> you, you've got Facebook, you've got Instagram, you've got TikTok, you've got SoundCloud, you've got Spotify, Bandcamp, all of the things, right? I'm running out of fingers. But my that was my mentality going in first. I didn't even know music was a part of this space. I was introduced to it by artworks and open sea and that's what i thought this space was about i landed in the lap of ocean floor music um they're no longer called ocean floor music they're called massive now they're rebranding they're totally pivoting more focused on like they used to be a marketplace they're moving into more of a fan focused thing like similar to what serenade's talking about um yeah. but my journey through that was yeah early on it's like how can I be everywhere in this space and it started with Twitter it started mm -hmm. with putting my ear to the the ground and hearing what everyone else was doing basically and learning that way um from there I learned what discord was I learned that there's many people trying to build marketplaces and push that stuff forward so I'm thinking like you know, back in the rise of the internet and the survivors were Amazon and eBay, right? And all these other ones didn't survive. So my mentality was like, be everywhere. One of those, one of these paths will take off. Yeah. Um, it's very naive to think because it's literally about how you show up anyway. So I quickly kind of found that it doesn't matter where, I put my stuff it just matters how I'm nurturing my community and when I make those offers so right. yeah, it was a very uh it was a learning curve but yeah still got shit everywhere <laughs> it's it's quite interesting because I know um Lauka you've tried a few different things to see what works with your community as well which we can talk about in a bit but it goes to show in Web3, it's still kind of a situation where people are throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks and there's no one size fits all approach, right? Mm. Um, yeah. So I guess on that, um, let's talk about one of the most complicated things in Web3 surrounding adoption, which is the challenges and misconceptions in the space. Um, so Katie, I wanted to know what are the biggest challenges and misconceptions that have sort of come your way? Um, I think as well, particularly dealing with major artists and maybe the perception of fans, whether there's resistance and whatnot, and if that's evolved. Yeah, I think, you know, since that kind of hype period in 2021, there has been a kind of increase in the challenges around particularly NFTs. Um, I think a lot of the negative perceptions around Web3 and NFTs more broadly has come from fans not having a good experience. Either mm. the price point has been too high, so it's felt quite unattainable for most, or maybe a lot of that early tech created a bit of a clunky process to purchase without the knowledge of Web3 and crypto. And I think on top of that, many people have seen NFTs as a speculative asset sold to people who are hoping that the price will go up one day. And I think the general space of art, like Web3 and art NFTs has been littered with speculation mm -hmm. with most people purchasing to make a profit rather than appreciate it. And that's not really the way that people appreciate music. I think, you know, when you find a new artist or a song that you love, you are not initially attracted to it with the idea that you can profit from it. The appreciation of the music is what comes first. Mm -hmm. So I think really education and accessibility are huge priorities at the moment. You know, in order to work out how all of these different web free tools and platforms can better serve artists, there needs to be more understanding both from artists and from fans. Like at, at Serenade, we ensure that 
ease of access is central to everything that we do. So we're serving all music fans, not just those that have an interest in Web3, keeping that the tech really in the background as much as possible and placing the music front and center. Um, and this is like everything from providing payment solutions that don't require crypto knowledge or usage um, or to building, you know, collections rather than wallets um, alongside like aligning our product values the, with those that music fans already love. And I think, you know, we're kind of focused more on understanding the unique challenges our artists face. And we've also worked very, very closely with the music industry over the last three years to create a product and a platform that is easily accessible by all artists at all career stages, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, but also like giving fans the, the opportunity to participate in this new release format. So I think making the experience easy and enjoyable is really key to overcoming a lot of those existing misconceptions. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, we have um, a question from AJ, which I'll address. But first, I do want to ask Stonewax and Lauka, mm -hmm. what is the biggest challenge that you guys have personally encountered as an artist venturing into the Web3 space? You go first, Stonewax. Biggest challenge? Um, realizing that it takes more than just creating the art and cultivating that community. Like it does, it does take some, like you've got to, like, I, I kind of want to roll back and just add to what Katie was saying about the digital pressings. Like and that's just one way to format an NFT. NFTs can literally be whatever you want it to, to be. It's a contract that mm -hmm. says something is worth something, right? So in Serenade's respect, you guys are creating virtual records. Basically, you're creating that album digitally for collection in the digital format. Um, Lauka touched on utility. You know, there's so there's a huge misconception around what the like what you have to do in this space. I feel like NFT is such a it's such a dangerous term, <laughs> you know, it, it really just like. Type that in, you bring all the trolls out. Exactly right. So <laughs> get rid of that term. Don't worry about it. it. It just means contract. So you're creating a contract around your art and you're delivering that to, you're making that offer to your community. The misconception I had is like, when I first got into the space, I just put my art on OpenSea. I was like, nothing's happening. <laughs> of course nothing's happening because who who's gonna see that? It's just in the open sea, right? It's it's swimming with mm -hmm. the rest of the fishes. So you've got to, you know, there's there's cultivation that really needs to happen. Whether you've got a fan base or not, you need to introduce them to this space and help them understand why you're approaching this. As an mm. artist, you might be like, this is where I'm going to put my rarest stuff. You know, this is where the exclusive things will be. If you want it, come and get it, you know. So I think there's a, um, there is a stigma. Yeah. Um, and it does take doing your own research. There's another term in this space, D-Y-O-R, do your own research. Mm -hmm. yes. definitely do your own research in every aspect like you would um researching your distributor before you put that song on dsps you're going to make a choice for yourself but understanding how to make the offer at the right time to a community that you've cultivated that's where the work is i believe mm. and how about you lauka um, I think quite similar to what Stonewax is saying. Um, the first one is actually being on top of um, knowing things. The space does move fast and to, to learn what's happening, what's the latest thing, how the tech has developed, that actually takes effort. I think, um, and one of the things that I've realized is that people are generally lazy. 
when it comes to making an effort to do people, you know, we, we live in a society now that values convenience. So, which is uh, one thing that Serenade clearly understands when they've made their platform for convenience. You know, you don't have to get a wallet. You don't have to, uh, to you know, learn about crypto. It's, it's very accessible. So I think like for me as an artist, my, on, on my end, the biggest challenge has been to educate myself and keep up to date. But I also, I think this is also really good to segue into a question that AJ Lee has raised in the chat about, um, mm -hmm. you know, knowing if your community or fan base are, are ready to purchase that. I think um, you mm -hmm. won't know if they're ready until you start asking them, if asking them and talking to them about it. So um, in, in my experience, I ran a survey, I sent them an email and the, um, the response was actually a very negative response of, no, we don't want it. Uh, it's bad for the environment, uh, rah, 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 all these myths. And I understood where they were coming from. And then that's when I realized I had to educate them. So that was when I started to create content on web two to talk about my journey, what I've learned today, why I'm doing it. And then once I started doing that, that started to get my um, like community on board. And sure, there's some that, you know, still aren't ready yet, but then some did come on board. So I think education, just like educating yourself first and then sharing that education with others, but making it accessible. As in like, mm -hmm. don't, there, there will be some of your friends or some of your community who will click on that link and read like a, a whole white paper or watch a whole YouTube tutorial for, for 40 minutes. But yeah. most people won't do that. They will scroll on their phone. So you've got to give them like, little bits of information that mm. is digestible and mm. and that was kind of how I approached it was like just digestible instead of like slamming them with all this like info and you know technical talk um, because that just turns people off I think so yeah I guess touching a bit on what Katie said oh. um, about education being so important and as well as what Stonewax is saying about building that community like you're not going to be appealing for people to to you know engage with you if if you're not accessible as a person I think like especially like in today's society we we follow brands whether that brand be a product a service an artist we follow brands for the idea that they're selling us not not so much their utility mm -hmm. we really think about it like the consumers like want something, want an idea that you're selling them. Um, so it's, I guess it's up to the artist to figure out how they can still like be authentically themselves and then bring people along for their journey instead of just slamming it down their throats or, or just not creating any context around why they're doing something, yeah. like why they're dropping an NFT uh, like and no explanation, no context. Just like, hey guys, it's on OpenSea, and like, go get it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No and, one's gonna care. Yeah. I've and I've really enjoyed watching both of your journeys because I know, like, Luck, as you've mentioned, you've sort of um, engaged in surveys and taken that educational approach. Um, whereas Stonewax, I know you'd have more of what I'd call probably more web three native approach, which has been working with your audience, which is attending mm. those Twitter spaces and, you know, dropping on different platforms and whatnot. Um, yeah. Which is, which is kind of a testament to, you know, what you guys are doing with um, really understanding your audience and your community and working with what works for them. Mm. Um, okay. So how are we doing for time? 20 minutes. Speaking of, things changing fast, which you mentioned before, um, I want to touch on AI really quickly. So we have seen it storm into our lives in the last six to 12 months. Um, how do you guys think it's going to affect the music industry? It's going to be so <laughs> part of it, already part of it. And I think we use it way more than people realize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think it's so, just going to happen in parallel. Um, if you were to think about what the iPhone did for social media, it's what's I, what AI is doing for Web3. They're not the same thing. They're just happening at the same time. 
Yeah. And I think one will influence the other for sure, you know. Yeah, it's, and it's interesting to see how it's been almost complimentary. Becky's just mentioned in chat um, Grimes's AI voiceover. So, yeah, I guess on that, we can either talk about that a little bit more or if you guys have seen anything that's been really interesting, particularly tied in with Web3. Well, Grimes's situation is very unique because she is, all right, so she's not the only artist that has an AI version of her. Drake has had this done. You guys, what we were talking about this song earlier before the session. Drake, their reaction is a complete polar opposite. Exactly. So Drake was pissed off that this happened, right? He's like, you someone's stealing my context? intellectual property. So yeah, uh, an AI generated version of Drake. So someone has made a track and used Drake's voice, an AI generated version of Drake's voice. Okay. They put the track out, it blew up. Drake got the shits because someone stole his voice and used his intellectual mm -hmm. property. Fair enough. If you don't want that as an artist, it shouldn't happen, really. Grimes, on the other hand, she's embraced this fact and she has put the word out to her community. If you use my voice as an AI or in AI standards and create a track and put it out, you'll get 50-50 cuts with me and we'll own a song together. Now, very different like Lalka said this is two ends of the spectrum like one's for one's totally against and I really think Grimes is only going to help her career by her decision like she's had and how many hundred thousands of people submit tracks for this and she's getting content created for her right she's not lifting a finger she people are creating all this content in, in this catalog for her and she's owning 50 percent of it still if that was me i'm like hell yeah use me <laughs> abuse the fact i'm all for that and one of those cool things is she's using blockchain um to enforce it somewhat as well yeah yeah okay so looking into the future then uh Katie, how do you see Web3 transforming the industry in the coming years? And what role do you think artists and industry can play in shaping its future? I guess, I don't know if I see it totally transforming the music industry of what, where we are today. I think it's, you know, the Spotify's, Apple's will continue to exist. But I think it's actually going to provide a very interesting addition to each artist's release cycle. So having that option to release music in this brand new format that has all the benefits that we discussed mm -hmm. around the ongoing royalties, option to connect better with fans, I think we'll just be able to see it grow. And as, as we go through it, it's really artists have a lot of educating to do to their fans. I think that's where we're at at the moment. We're still in that education fan. I, I don't really think that we've scratched the surface yet, to be honest. Can I um, add to that, Katie? Yeah. I feel like, yes, we need to totally educate ourselves. And that is because of how fast things are moving. Um, we are so used to like spotify and the convenience of all of that stuff that it is it is a, a disruption in what our habits are you know so it takes effort. yeah it takes effort it takes it takes that like retrospective look or that outside look at, at what's happening with how your business is running and yeah katie nailed it it's about that extra thing that you can deliver to your fans and that extra income stream or that extra little bit of effort that will keep your fans coming back at, like and also habit. like don't be fooled and i'm just speaking to i guess the people who aren't in music industry like spotify warner they're all investing in web3 and mm -hmm. like in you know behind the scenes they know that this thing is going to take off they're not just sitting there twiddling their thumbs going oh we'll be fine with spotify no they're getting involved as well so um mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, you know, just because they're not making noise now about it, they are investing in it in the background. So, and I there's ways that people so much part of our industry. Yeah, and there's gonna and there's gonna be, or well, there are ways for 
we call them the normies, it's creating frictionless ways for them to be able to collect this stuff. So yeah. you know, Nif- Nifty Gateway, Serenade, Sound XYZ just started doing it. You can collect with your credit card. Everyone's Everyone was so hesitant to save their credit card details online for so long. Yeah, now, 10 years ago, your parents now, wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, now it takes three seconds to send a thousand bucks somewhere. But, you know, this is giving us that chance to really, yeah, create wonderful offers and yeah. destroy that friction. Yeah, for sure. And I guess with those um, major companies investing as well, NFTs also have that utility behind them, whether you want to token gate content or reward fans with another drop or something. I know you guys do that on um, Serenade where artists can sort of um, add additional perks to their tokens and then other platforms have it inbuilt as well. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. This this is the exciting part where we will see different applications of the technology and I think having things like the digital pressing, which utilizes blockchain technology, that's just one form that a release that can happen with an artist. But I think what is really exciting is what are the other applications that are being worked Mm -hmm. on and where will all of this kind of be able to connect with each other in the future. So for example, you can already give your Discord, if you, if someone in your Discord purchases a digital pressing, you can give them a unique role in your Discord based on the fact that they own one of your digital pressings. Like things like that, connecting the dots between what is or what you've already built and released and other areas of your digital community out there. I think that's where it will be quite exciting. Yeah, for sure. Okay, guys. Um... I'll move on to this quickly, being conscious of time and leaving time for questions as well. Um, Can each of you provide me with a tip for newcomers in the Web3 music space? Who wants to start? You're you're not in Stonewax, so. All right, all right. Get on Twitter. (laughs) Get on Twitter. Best thing I ever did for this space. Look, it's as transparent as the internet will ever be. Um, you can use Twitter as your voice for your business. Very important. You do not have a voice if you're only using Instagram. That's a Polish turd. Get a voice, get Twitter. <laughs> Wise words. Thank you, yeah. Stonework. <laughs> and Laka, what are your thoughts? Any tips? Um, DM someone, with, whether it's on Instagram or Twitter, you know, if you're not ready for Twitter yet. I'm, I'm actually not on Twitter that much. Um, DM someone you know who is who is in the space and say, hey, I'm interested in this. Can I ask you questions? Okay, you might get someone who's like, no, I don't have time for you. But the thing is, like, most of them will be like, yeah, sure, ask me questions. And that was how I got started. Like, just started DMing people who I saw were active. And I was like, hey, can I ask you about, you know, X, Y, Z or whatever. And you mean Web3 artists? Yeah, yeah. Um, so like artists who were already involved in Web3 and, you know, like I just snooped around Twitter and like, you know, just like um, artists I was following on Instagram who were getting into Web3, I just DM them and go, I'm interested in this. Can I, you know, ask you a few questions, pick your brains. And like, I was fortunate to have like a few of them go like, yeah, do you want to jump on a call? I like, they were, because I mm-hmm. guess because they're one of the early once mm-hmm. you go into the space, they're so passionate. They're willing to like get on a call with you and tell you about it, not just like reply, you yeah. know? Yeah. So that was really valuable to me. Like when I was starting and I was like, oh, I don't know where to start. Um, yeah. was just DMing people go, I'm interested. Can I ask you questions? I love and, how welcoming then- the space is as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they point you like links, they, you know, and so then you yeah. go on your own discovery journey. Um, yeah but it's a good place to start and how about you Katie I think there's a huge amount of information out there um, through podcasts YouTube videos really there's so much and I think you know if you're interested in learning more about the digital pressing we have an entire dedicated site of basically what we call an artist success guide which is everything that you could possibly want to know about the digital pressing from what it actually is to how to promote it, 
and everything else in between. So I can drop that in the chat as well. But I think just DMing people is the best way to learn. Mm -hmm. There's been so many, and, and then it is such an inclusive community. There's been so many people that I've learnt, met along this journey who they don't even like, it's not even like we want anything from each other. We just want to chat and keep mm -hmm. that relationship going. So yeah. So it is the most yeah, hot really network ever right now. And if you can't learn something from someone, you're doing something wrong. You know, everyone is there willing to help and give advice away for free. So great. Yeah. Good call, ladies. Yeah. Um, okay. So where, if you could send people to one place to get started, whether it be a resource, a newsletter, a blog, whatever, what's your favorite, guys? Unfortunately, we don't have time to list them all, but where would you recommend people go? Um, I subscribe to this newsletter, this email newsletter called Web3 Daily. It's actually pretty fun I to have read. That one. Yeah, yeah, they're good writers and they explain it in a very easy to learn way. And and that's not just music, it's just Web3 in general. And so, yeah. Uh, let's see if I can find a link. I'll drop it in chat. Yeah, we'll drop it in chat. Um, another good one is um, Rob's, Rob. Abelou's newsletter if anyone follows that it's called where's music going um I'll find that as well and drop it in as a resource but he's he's a great voice in the space as well um any other additions you guys yeah so for those who don't like reading there's a couple of good podcasts <laughs> love that <laughs> one's called web3 business michael mm -hmm. stelsner can you all see that Web3 Business Podcast. And then there's another one called Web3 Academy. So very raw, to the point, no bullshit. Also, um, there's a bunch of free courses out there. Muse, get onto their website. There's a free course that's really awesome. There's also, I recommend just jumping on these different platforms and having a look around. Um, I wanted to answer on this. I wanted to answer AJ's question about mm -hmm. um, what should artists or their teams expect to invest? Look, this is a huge rabbit hole, dude. Sorry, if you're a dude or do that, homie. Um, when I first got in the space and I was moving art, gas, if you don't know what gas is, that's the cost of the transaction to be made. That is literally the only middleman payment you'll pay for. But when I moved into the space, it was a bull market, which means the market was moving hard and fast. Yeah. I paid $85 American per transaction. Killer. You don't want to do that. Wait until the market drops. You can literally track your gas fees or whenever you do a transaction, but wait for for that stuff to drop before you go and spread yourself too thin. Yeah, um, it's also low yeah. cost. Sorry, yeah. Sorry no, go for it. replying to AJ's question, I like I really appreciate that question because you know uh, they're wanting to learn about short term and long term ROIs, and I mm -hmm. don't think we've got enough time in this panel, but I just want to say that it's such an in depth discussion of many variants and it's pro that's probably a really frustrating answer to get yeah but like if if you want to dm me i'm more than happy to like have a conversation because it's not just you know a, a formula a strategy I'm, I'm more than happy to have a conversation if um aj lee wants to dm me on socials yeah um, so. ditto that to anyone else yeah. like it's it is a quite a um like it's it's the wild west you know it's the new it's the new space and you can easily spend money by accident so yeah reach yeah. out to someone don't be afraid to ask questions and yeah thank you for adding to my nonsense locker it's not nonsense <laughs> so on that um neil do you mind sharing the socials of our lovely panelists and we can just talk about if there's any projects you guys want to plug. Um, yeah. Uh, do you want to begin, Lauka? Because I know you got something coming up. 
Yay. Yeah. So I'm dropping five editions of a digital pressing tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. with Serenade. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this will be Thank my you. third drop with Serenade and um, I'm releasing it two days early before streaming platforms. And um, I decided to go with Serenade because it was uh, something that was more accessible to my fan base. Um, yeah, so it's a mixtape, it's 13 tracks plus um, signed digital artwork, voice notes, digital zine, and a full mix as well. So five editions because I want to keep it pretty small and special and rare. Um, yeah, over to Stonewax. <laughs> yeah, so um, you can find me at stonewax.xyz. There's lots of stuff to look at on that website. Um, in terms of what's happening soon, I'm about to put on an exhibition, actually, a, a music NFT exhibition. So cool. Yeah, so that's a that's definitely a first for me. Um, inspired by Oshi Gallery down in Melbourne. If anyone doesn't know Oshi Gallery, you should definitely check out those guys. They that was my introduction to music NFTs and um the concept of music artists being showcase showcased in this way is extremely interesting to me and I'm going to try it, you know, see if I can fill a bunch of flat screen panels with music and art. So yeah. Where's yeah, that you happening? Know. Sorry. Where's that happening? It'll be on the Sunshine Coast here at um, Underground NFT Gallery. Yeah. We should road trip. Yeah, you should. Yeah. When is it? Um, haven't got a date yet. Looking at early to mid July. I'm very excited for it. Yeah. I'll probably make a trip up to the sunny coast for that. Definitely. Yeah, I'll make sure you all get uh, get an invite for sure. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. How about yourself, Katie? Anything in the works for Serenade? Serenade? Well, we always have quite a few releases each week. So, yeah, just serenade.co forward slash Lauka tomorrow. Snap up one of her five editions. We also have a email that goes out once a fortnight to our collectors. We call it the Collectors Club. Um, so if anybody would want, like, would want to sign up to that, I'll drop it in the chat. In there, it's just a bit of a wrap up around what we have coming up um, in terms of releases on Serenade. And sometimes we do a little bit more in depth with an artist interview or just something else about the release. It's quite an interesting newsletter that gets sent once every two weeks. I'll drop in the link now. Great. Looking forward to that. Okay, um, amazing guys. Um, thank you so much for the time today. If if you're interested as well as the audience in passing on the recording or having another listen, um, it'll, it will be available on VMDO's website maybe around next week. Um, but we, we are kind of at the end of call time. Up to you guys if you want to hang around for five minutes and ask questions. I know, Katie, you might have something to run to, but yeah. Are, are you guys okay to ask a few questions or you got to run? Yeah, I'm good. Just let us know when you need to go, Katie. Okay, cool. Um, have you guys in the chat got any further questions you want to ask? I love someone the asked, of Someone asked if I can pick them up. <laughs> we, we carpool them. Okay. There's a few. There's a few coming from Brisbane. We'll yeah, get you we should get a bus. Yeah, yeah, we we'll get a <laughs> we'll get a bus. Yeah, it'll be fun road trip. I'll bring the snacks. I'm not saying no to snacks. <laughs> yeah. That's so cheesy. Yeah, well, all right. I don't ride, it's, so. Oh, it's all right. You can, you can ride with us, genuinely. But anyway, we will talk about that <laughs> offline. Um, okay, guys, thank you. I guess no further cues. Um, you have everyone's contact, so I'm sure that these guys are happy to continue the conversation. And um, yeah, thanks so much for joining today. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, VMJ. Thank I'll close it off now. Appreciate Bye. you guys. Bye, guys. Bye. See ya.